We got sick with COVID-19 in my house. My life partner was um, diagnosed on the same time I was basically, which was November 4th. We went and got our test done, but he had gone to get a x-ray or a CT scan because he has cancer. And the people there at the cancer clinic called him and said, you have COVID lungs, you need to go get tested immediately. So we did. My sister didn't have it and he and I had it. And then they gave us uh, uh, oximeters to test our oxygen levels. And my partner is 72 years old. He has cancer, he has diabetes, so he has those co comorbidities. And I have similar types of comorbidities. And his, almost immediately his oxygen levels start hitting below 90, 84, 85. And his um, <coughs> cancer doctor called and said, how, are you, how is he doing? And I said, not good. I said, this is like, Immediately, he's going down into the 80s with his oxygen levels, and his temperature is the same and whatnot. But anyway, he ended up going into the hospital like that day, and he was in the hospital till November 20th. Meanwhile, I was homesick, and I was uh, went to the emergency three times, and our system here is not geared for this type of emergencies, I mean, overwhelming emergencies. So my oxygen levels would go low and they, and they had an emergency take, uh, ambulance take me to emergency and come to find out that I had to find my own ride back from the hospital. And of course they bring my oxygen levels up and then I would be fretting and we're dealing with trying to get back. And so it was not a healing situation. And I finally called um, the Indian Health Service and I said, you know, they're not, I don't have a ride back from the hospital. And this was a Friday. They won't let me make arrangements because if you have COVID-19, you, you have to be medically transported. And they want my family to come and pick me up, but my family are all medically fragile. And the only one who isn't, or who, who um, they called, was my younger sister who doesn't have a driver's license. And she, she kept telling them, I can't pick her up. So anyway, I ended up getting a ride home. Two times that happened, and then by the third, th third time, I told the EMTs, and by that time I was just like shooting out tears. I said, you know what? I am not gonna go back to emergency. I am not gonna be stranded in Madras. If all they're gonna do is give me oxygen, why can't you give me oxygen here at home? And they said, well, you're not authorized for oxygen. I said, I have COVID-19, you know, I, I need oxygen. And so the guy there, he was a wonderful guy. He pulled out this little tank and he gave it to me. And he said, we will call your doctors and tell them that you need oxygen and you can keep this tank for as long as you need it and until it's empty. So I had also been um, using herbs and Indian medicine during this time. My lungs were really, uh, I had pneumonia of course, and I was supposed to be taking steroids and the emergency doctor had prescribed it for me and I said, to him, I need to have that cleared by my cardiologist because I am prone to having tachycardia events, which are my, my highest heart rate was over 160. Wait, no, 260 was my highest heart rate. And I said, so I really need to have his approval, but he never put the prescription in for me. So for all of that weekend, I didn't have the help of that medication. And when I finally had the medication prescribed, the Indian Health Service and the COVID-19 unit uh, were so busy that they couldn't deliver my medicine. And they said, can't you just get in the car and come pick up your medicine? And I said, well, I have COVID-19 and I have double vision because one of the blood vessels to my eye muscle burst and my eyes are now double, double crossed. So no, I'm not allowed to drive unless I put on a patch, I guess, but I can't get out to my car and drive. It just wasn't possible, I was so weak. And we eventually received our medicine and our family and friends brought my sister and I food, and only one time did the COVID-19 bring food, and they brought a, you know, one grocery bag. And, but I was sick from the 4th till the 21st. That was my quarantine. So I had friends who were on uh, SNAP go and spend their own money to get us food. And my uncle, who was a wonderful man, came and left food on our car because he couldn't get any closer to that because he didn't want to get sick. And he'd call and say, get your turkey before the dogs do. 
So my sister would go out and get it. And the, the amazing thing was my sister took the protocol to heart when they gave her the, the paperwork on her being negative. And she said, Lizzie, you can only stay in your bedroom and use the bathroom. And if you go in the kitchen, you need to let me know and, I, er, and wipe, your, wipe it down after yourself. And then I go in and I wipe it down. And I said, okay. She said, you have to stay six feet away from me. I said, okay. And so and <laughs> she didn't get sick that whole time. And she, did, she opened up the windows in the house. She opened up my bedroom windows. Every day she brought me tea if I started coughing, hot tea, ginger tea, and honey. And then of course, all the other medicines that I had. I had herbs like mullein, and there's just a ton of herbs that I was taking that were, um, I think, really helpful in keeping my lungs clear and, and preventing it from getting worse. And I had Indian herbology when I was at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And I've always listened to people talking about the benefits of juniper berries and juniper like a sauna, but also the benefits of having cedar on the stove and using cedar steam also to clear your nose because it's antibacterial and antifungal. And I think a lot of secondary COVID-19 uh, episodes, secondary um, illnesses come from the, you being weak having a weak uh, system, and then other things take advantage of it. People die from it. And finally, when um, my partner was giving the okay to come home, he spent $300 of his own money to hire medical transport because I couldn't go. I couldn't drive. I was too weak to even go to Bend and Back. And the hardest thing for us was talking it through afterwards is that we felt like we were, it was extremely hard to get better. That we were extremely weak and we couldn't do the things that we normally consider doing, even in our own house. We found that, um, you know, prior to our diagnosis with COVID-19, Dwight had fallen in the house twice, which was really unusual for me, six foot four, six foot five which is unusual for him, but he said I was so weak, my leg just gave out. He has one leg. It just, psh, there I was on the floor. And he said, I think it was COVID-19. And I said, I bet you it was. It was a predecessor to the becoming full onset. And the other thing that we were grateful for was we had so many loving friends and family who were keeping in contact with us. and. I couldn't answer phones, I couldn't answer texts, I couldn't answer messages, but I could occasionally could pick up the phone and call my aunt. You know, you, my aunt is my little mother, you know. You know, auntie, and, <laughs> and talk. But I think we felt that we had prepared ourselves well. We had a month's worth of food, basically food, basic food, in our house, staples. But then again, I couldn't get up and cook it. We had, uh, the only thing we needed to really replenish were the fresh fruits and vegetables that actually were the only things that I could eat. Um, my sister is not a cook, but she made <laughs> the dishes that our mom and our grandma made. And for whatever reason, they were just so amazing. You know, she, she got our dried deer meat out of the freezer and pounded it and put it in luckamine and gave it to me. She put carrots and celery in there. She said, I know mom puts this in there, so she put it in there. She made um, just things that I didn't know she knew how to make. They're very simple, very basic, but they were the things that our grandmother would make for us our whole lives. There was a time when we were being raised by our grandparents that we never had to Every day we had breakfast on the table. Every day we had lunch and dinner on the table. She did that. She put me on a schedule of eating, even if I didn't want to. And I, I just ate a little bit and she'd take it away. But I think the greatest experience for us out of COVID-19 was looking back 14 days from when we were diagnosed to where we were. And Dwight was in a business in Redmond, Miller Paint, getting deck paint for our back. back patio 
because there was a small window of time that we could get it painted. And he said the whole time he was there, none of the staff or the customers were wearing masks. And he did, and, but he was there for over half an hour. He was exposed. And the other place that I could have gotten it was at our workshop. We had food there. I went there for a window of time. Everybody was healthy, but I couldn't, maybe one of the individuals there was a, didn't have symptoms, an asymptomatic carrier. So we both felt like those were two places that we could have been encountered, we could have encountered the virus, but I know the museum was kept impeccably clean. I know that when they came in, the people came in, everybody got their temperature taken, they washed their hands and sanitized it. We stayed away from each other six feet. There was no like close, really close proximity, and I didn't participate in the, in the whole thing anyway. I just was observing so that I could see what we could do for ourselves. So COVID-19 changed us in that way, but we lost people to COVID-19. And the trauma of it, we said we both were traumatic. It was traumatic for us. We were still getting, we were, we were still being like punched in the gut by people dying, we're still being punched in the gut by people who didn't care. And we're walking around saying there's no such thing as COVID-19. And even the social media people were saying, people I knew were saying that it doesn't, it's not that bad. And I went, there was a point when Dwight was, and I were, decide, we were talking and he got so bad I got off the phone and I was crying. My sisters came in. She says, you know you can't cry. You are not allowed to cry. You have to be strong. You have to realize that Dwight is strong. And if you start crying, you're going to weaken yourself. And I said, it could help me feel better. And she said, you know, taking care of yourself is going to make you feel better. She said, praying to God will make you feel better. Know that grandma and grandpa and our ancestors are all here 100% making sure that everything happens to you happens for the good. And I said, okay. I had to just accept that, that I couldn't be weak. And I couldn't give in to the fact that we will never, we might not see each other again. So sleeping upright, if we could. Um, I had a lot of chest congestion, so I spent a lot of time <coughs> clearing up. In, in the shower, you bend over forward. When the air, air is moist, you bend forward and you cough from the bottom of your lungs. So it doesn't stay there, because if, you, if it stays there, that's what gets the, the pneumonia going. So yeah, there's just so much that we could do. And, but people weren't really able to listen. There's not a um, reason at all for anyone to not follow protocol. There is no reason at all for restaurants to not be mindful of regulations in the state. If they don't follow this regulation of, for the safety of others, how can I believe they are following other regulations for the safety of our food? I said, that's a contradiction of behavior. And so now we've observed who, who is pretty much politicizing this, and we're not going to even go there anymore because it's irrational. They don't follow science. They don't believe in it. They're outlaws and they're breaking the law. Well, heck, I'm part outlaw. I know how it feels to be an outlaw and why I do some things I do, you know. Uh, but I'm not out to harm anybody. I don't want to harm anybody at all. And I don't want anyone to get hurt from my actions. And that's kind of what the tra traditional law says, is do no harm. Uh, my, my grandmother, my grandfather raised me and my sister Jolene. And they took, they told a lot of stories about their childhood and their life. And um, my grandmother said basically, you know, to put strength into us. And that's the way they shared knowledge. 
But when she was a young girl, she was born in 1908. My grandfather was born in 1910. He's born here at the Pitt Ranch, which is up to Nana Valley. And she was born at Kanita because that's her great-grandmother. And that's where she was born. And then the epidemic of the Spanish flu was like 1912 to probably 16 before it finally abated. But her, she lost her brother and her mother to the Spanish flu. And her grandmother, she was the youngest one, immediately isolated her into a tule hut and started giving her medicines to keep her strong and to help her immune system. And my grandmother remembers her mother suffering and, and really feeling bad that she couldn't do anything about it. She couldn't comfort her. She couldn't be next to her. And then she died. And my grandmother said I was an orphan. My grandfather lost a lot of siblings in that flu. And he lost his mom when she was 16 and his dad when he, I think he's a little bit younger, not to the Spanish flu, but he was also an orphan. And, you know, we go up to the cemetery and their graves aren't marked, but I know that there would have been a lot more people in our family if they had survived. And it was a disease of, of similar, I mean, similar kind of nature in that people didn't understand it. It was very new, novel in its own way, and people didn't practice anything about preventing it. They didn't wear, they, were, they had all these recommendations then too. People says, nope, I don't have to do that. And it got us here in Northwest, the Pacific Northwest, no matter, it, it just traveled in the air or something. It, it, they figured it'd never get here, but it did. And it was, it, it killed people. So when my grandma was older, you know, that's how she'd talk about it. And then she'd sing songs for me and my sister. And he, she just said, I'm putting strength into you because someday I'll be gone and you'll need the strength to carry on and go forward. She says, you have to go forward. And you know, the other thing she used to say was, I've lived my life, now it's your turn to live yours. So there was a lot of loss in their lives, and I know that they had a very, very strong religious belief, and they had a very strong um, understanding of tradition, traditional beliefs as well. And I know that my grandfather spoke like seven languages. He spoke English, he spoke Kikisht, he spoke Chinook Jargon, he spoke Nez Perce, he spoke Yakima, he spoke Warm Springs. And, you know, that was just a tradition in his family. And that whole line of people who could speak all those languages were kind of wiped out. And I know that he, um, He carried a different kind of knowledge in himself because he knew all those languages. And my grandmother said she didn't understand. She said, sometimes I forget my Indian words. But I noticed that when she would say something, the Indian people would get real quiet because they're powerful words. So whatever she needed to remember came to her when she needed it. And I know that that's how I felt when I was laying in, in bed thinking about <laughs> living, that those words came to me, and those songs came to me. And I know that I don't know how to sing them, but I do know it when I hear them. And Dwight says that's auditory hallucinations, that we all have auditory hallucinations. And I said, yeah, but I do have, also believe in our sub-memory sub that is, you know, unconscious, captures everything, so. I've, dr I've dreamt in Japanese, I've dreamt in Ijishkin, I've dreamt in Navajo, and I think I've even dreamt like in French, which is like, why? Because <laughs> you just pick it, you, you just hear it, and you just, whatever it is, you just, and it somehow it carries you, you carry it. I would take the vaccine because we can prevent a lot of really serious complications. If you take the vaccine, you won't be as sick, is, is what my understanding. Uh, there were a couple of times I never took the flu vaccine and I didn't get sick, but that's because I'm hypervigilant about a lot of stuff, you know, that I, in my workplace, keeping my space clean. But this 
particular illness. I took the first dose and my arm got really sore even though you're supposed to exercise, do all this stuff. I took Tylenol to cut, take care of the pain, but I still have this lingering headache. But I'm not sure if that's not lingering headache from COVID-19. But if you're f experiencing complications, or you're not a complications, if you're experiencing the side effects, that means your body is working. People, I guess, the, misunderstand about why we get symptoms. Those symptoms are your body fighting the invader. So if you're experiencing those symptoms, it's a good thing because that means they're, ki they're killing off the intruder, but also your body is building itself up and, and shifting all its energy to figure out how to fight what's attacking you. So your body's getting trained, and I think that's really important. Uh, the second shot I hear is even worse, but you know I'm willing to, to go through that, and if I have any kind of s dangerous aspects to that, I will make sure to go in and have someone look at me. But I think that 95% is a very good percentage.